All right, we're back. <laughs> Live from Crestone, Colorado. Yeah, baby. I'm here, I'm back. Hi, everybody. This is Daniel Gray reporting live from Crestone, Colorado. This is the Trailer Park Prophet coming at you live from Crestone, Colorado. I can't believe it. My name is Daniel Gray. Thanks a lot for being here. I really appreciate it. Nice to uh, have you here. I, I put together the show today on the fly. I'm over here at the Bliss in Crestone, Colorado. I just moved here yesterday and I was having trouble getting electricity hooked up to my my fifth wheel so I couldn't do the show and I kept trying to fix the electrical and fix the electrical and I couldn't get her done, you know. At any rate, I went across the street from where I'm living in downtown Crestone and I'm here at the Bliss. I'm out on the porch. Um, here's Bailey Barker. Say hi, Bailey. And if you look right back there, that's Mount Crest. It's a 14er. I've been on top of that thing. And we're right next to the Santa de Cristo Wilderness. It goes all the way down there and all the way up to Slida. And the Santa de Cristo Mountain Range is the youngest mountain range in all of the Rocky Mountains. So they're really jagged and they're just absolutely beautiful. So I'm really thrilled to be back and I'm glad you're here this is uh, hump day with the prophet how about that man my life has been such a, a whirl I drove my my fifth wheel from Delta Colorado here to Crestone took me all day long I went over three mountain passes and there was snow on them and it was one hell of an experience I got here about five o'clock and got the electricity hooked up to my fifth wheel and went to sleep so this morning I had to reposition the old fifth wheel and try to get things hooked up but I'll be able to do that after the show um, let's see here I, I this is the first I've been on the internet for like 24 hours so I don't really know what the the trending news is but there's still a few things that I had left over to talk about or things I, I found on on Tuesday before I took off I'm out here on the porch I can't exactly see my arrow uh, I saw one story that I oh I know here's one thing I want to talk about and that is the birther story you know I really like reporting on whether or not President Obama was born in America or not because it's such a, a fascinating story and it just doesn't go away and one aspect to the birther story that I haven't brought up before and I don't think a lot of people out there actually know is that the whole birther issue was brought up by Hillary Clinton a lot of people don't know that and this story is from the Telegraph and the Telegraph is a pretty good source, I think, but the headline here reads, Birther Roe began with Hillary Clinton. The lie that Barack Obama was not born in the U.S. has been fueled by fringe Republicans, but supporters of Hillary Clinton, now Mr. Obama's Secretary of State, are largely to blame for starting it. And this story is pretty interesting because it talks about that this whole issue of whether or not President Obama was born in the U.S. or not came up during President Obama's first campaign for state senator in Illinois. And it came up again when he, he decided to run for the U.S. Senate. And the people that brought it up in Chicago were... Um, you know they were just they were just kind of dismissed but still you know it, it, it's a story that has swirled around President Obama his whole career and the fact that Hillary Clinton started it I think is kind of you know certainly adds a new twist to the whole story it says here false rumors about Mr. Obama's background first sur surfaced in 2004 in Illinois where he was a state senator Andy Martin a perennial local candidate and, and uh, litigant 
claimed Mr. Obama was secretly Muslim. Related stories including that he was radicalized in a madrasa in Indonesia developed after Mr. Clinton entered the national stage with a speech to the Democrat National Convention later that year. In 2005, Mr. Obama went to Washington as the junior U.S. Senator for, from Illinois. Rumors about him persisted but seemingly failed to take hold among political insiders and voters alike. It wasn't until 2008, at the height of the intensity, uh, bitter Democratic presidential primary process that both are that the touch paper was properly lit. An anonymous email circulated by supporters of Mrs. Clinton, Mr. Obama's main rival for the party's nomination, thrust a new allegation into the national spotlight that he had been from uh, born in Hawaii. So this story has been out there a long time. And this aspect of it just doesn't seem to come up. And I'm not really sure why. And I guess probably it doesn't come up because people that are, are so dedicated to President Obama aren't willing to look at any other alternative source except for what what fits their narrative for their guy. I mean, President Obama is a real, you know, obviously he's a big figure in history, but it goes on to say, and I think this is just kind of interesting because I think this article couches this discussion in kind of a fresh light. And it says here, it goes on to say, Barack Obama's mother was living in Kenya with his Arab African father. Late into her pregnancy, it was said, she was not allowed to travel by plane. So Barack Obama was born there and his mother then took him to the Hawaii to register his birth. Then in August 2008, Phil Berg, an ex-deputy attorney general for Pennsylvania and a renowned conspiracy theorist, filed a lawsuit alleging that Mr. Obama was ineligible to become a candidate. And it goes on and on. And I just, I thought it was kind of fascinating because I think like a lot of times we just kind of forget, you know, or just don't even know the genesis of stories that we take for granted. And and granted, the left has taken advantage of of the people that think maybe President Obama wasn't born in the U.S. and and vilified them into being nuts and ignoramuses and racists and whatnot. But you know who knows? I mean, if you look at President Obama's birth certificate, I, there are some things on it that are kind of unusual, like it calls um, President Obama's father a um a black and back in the days they called them negroes on birth certificates things like that you know discrepancies that make you look think like hey what's going on here this is kind of weird also if you look at, at his birth certificate it looks like a, a cut and paste job i mean it's really obvious if you take a look at it all right here i'm really happy here we're at the bliss cafe right yes we are by right look at this that looks beautiful. Thank you very much. You're very welcome. Look at that, huh? Isn't that cool? So, I got it. I don't know. I thought I'd better get my dog some food. Here. I'll tell you what. Rather, rather than eat in front of you, here's what I want to do. I just stumbled on this tape. And I've heard this before, too, and I, I was going to play it on the show, so I think what I'm going to do is just play it right now. And this is Bill Ayers. And this is back in the 70s when Bill Ayers was on the, the Weather Underground. Bill Ayers is a professor in Illinois and, and started Barack Obama's career. That's Bill Ayers. He's with the Weather Underground, and he was actually... Uh, I Here, listen to this. Listen. What's going to happen after we take Wait, just a second. Government. i got to set this up for uh, you. you know, we, we become responsible then. Okay, so Bill Air, this guy that you're going to hear when this, this first start starts is a guy that was in with the CIA. Or wait, no, he's with the FBI. FBI. And he infiltrated the Weather Underground back in the 70s, and he actually heard Bill Ayers and other people talk, and he went to their underground organizational meetings. And so he knows a lot of what's going on. So let's listen to Bill Ayers. And don't forget, Bill Ayers launched President, or uh, then the 
Barack Obama la launched uh, Barack Obama's uh, state senate candidacy. So let's listen to Bill Ayers. Take it away. Dead serious. Dead serious. Just like in Nazi Germany, they were dead serious about their um, eugenics and getting rid of all people that had deformities that the German government decided weren't appropriate to have in the blood pool, gene pool, dead serious. And the thing is, is that a lot of what is said behind closed doors amongst, amongst the progressive socialists is this kind of dead serious talk. When the professors in, in any campus get together in the conference room, and they have an opportunity to speak freely. And when I say professors, I mean the ones in the soft sciences, the ones that are in sociology, psychology, political science. They talk about stuff like this that Bill Ayers is talking about, about eugenics, and, and talk about how certain types of people shouldn't be in the gene pool. And they really see people who are conservative as people who are somehow genetic genetically inferior this this war of the ideologies between the the personal responsibility and the collective where there's a leadership elite what they try and do is reduce this down to a, a genetic difference that way they can justify doing things like doing away with people or at least you can give people the impetus to think that these individuals are are somehow innately evil and need to be eliminated. If you can if you can do that to your opposition, you can degrade them to the point of being less than human, then you can eventually reach a point in society where you can actually be involved with with eugenics and talk about the elimination of conservatives. I mean, that was exactly what this guy was talking about, was doing away with people who think that we should live within our means. I mean, what's a conservative? I mean, a conservative is somebody that is basically a fiscal and monetary conservative. They believe that we should 
be good stewards of the economy and not be injecting a lot of fake money into the economy. I mean, they're, that's a conservative. I mean, a conservative somebody that thinks that there ought to be personal responsibility. And, and that's not crazy, but what, what the progressive socialists have been very successful at doing is, is making the word conservative or the word Tea Party be something less than human. All right, let's see here, moving on. Um, uh, uh, we reported on that. I haven't read that article. I kind of don't want to look into that. Let's see, was inside job. Okay, this story here. All right, this story has been out there a lot, and we've talked about this numerous times, about Benghazi and what was the actual motivation behind the attack. We got something on your eye there. <clears throat> got to clean the little camera here. More and more on the internet and there's been more mention in in the lamestream media about how what happened in Benghazi was something other than what was purported by the White House and we have a, a new kind of um, I guess for, for I mean this is something that's been out there now this this comes by way of now the end begins Bombshell diplomatic agent reveals that Benghazi attack was an inside job. There you meathead. I got this dog begging for food here. Alright, and and this is by a guy, this is by exposing the Benghazi cover-up. They're saying the terrorists who attacked the Benghazi consulate last year knew the location of the safe room where the ambassador Chris Stevens and his security team sought shelter, according to the congressman who spoke for 90 minutes with a diplomatic security agent severely injured in the assault. Now, this is a big deal because these compounds that we have across the world, they're built in su uh, such a way to withstand the kind of attack that the Benghazi consulate had to endure. So there, the, the notion that anyone could could just bull rush a consulate in the US and not have the embassy staff safe is just is not their prep protocol that's not going to happen and one of the things that that keep these people safe is knowing where the the safe room is and and hiding things in such a way that that uh, insurgent force like this can't find these people and so the the notion that this was a setup job and that it had to do with a a false flag event of you know like capturing the ambassador in Benghazi, Chris Stevens, doing something like that, or the the connection that this Benghazi attack had to do with ballistic missiles. That's the latest thing that's out there that's starting to get more credibility. I mean, it's been out there for over a year that somehow. This had something to do with the exchange of surface-to-air missiles. I mean, there's a report I didn't, that I read here recently where people are saying that the terrorist or some nefarious force got a hold of over 250 surface-to-air missiles, what they call the Stinger missiles, that can take out aircraft. Now, if that's the case and, and not a rumor, then we're in a lot of trouble. But if it isn't the case and it is a rumor, it's just kind of interesting how things in the modern day of the Internet just get out there. And, you know, it adds a lot to the, the psychic of our society, if you will. But anyway, when, this guy went on to say this congressman finally met with, with a, a few of the Benghazi survivors. Remember, we've been talking about how the 30 or so Benghazi survivors have, have been shielded from the press by the Obama administration. But he goes on to say, he says, he confirmed this, that it was a very well orchestrated and well organized, almost a military operation using military weapons and using military signals. That's interesting, military signals. The late Florida rep Bill Young said after the meeting, diplomatic security agent David Ubin at Walter Reed Medical Center last summer when both were patients there. And if I'm not mistaken, these two individuals were the ones that were severely hurt and injured. 
But at any rate, goes on to say, it says, after Young's death in mid-October, his widow, Beverly Young, gave Fox permission to use her husband's comments about the 9-11-2012 terrorist attack on record because he was sworn secrecy, but he put all this down. And, and in the event of his, his death, his wife, Beverly Young, could reveal it to the press. I mean, God, how... I mean, that's interesting. I mean, talk about international intrigue. The congressman had originally spoken to Fox on background last summer. He, uh, Ubin, emphasized the fact that it was a very, very military type of operation. They had no knowledge of almost every, oh no, that said they had knowledge of almost everything in the compound. Young explained they knew where the, the gasoline was, they knew where the generators were, they knew where the safe room was. They knew more than they should have about the compound. U Ubin, a severely injured, uh, was severely injured defending the CIA annex when a mortar fire rained down on the rooftop, top, killing former Na Navy SEALs Tyrone Woods and Glenn Dotery. And several injured a third CIA contractor who was interviewed by the House Intelligence Committee Thursday. After multiple surgeries, a, a source close to the contractor confirmed he was not regained the full use of his arm. But at any rate, he said, okay, asked if Urban believed the terrorists had inside information or had done reconnaissance. Young told Fox, yes, he and Urban did. It was pretty well figured out where everything was, where the doors were located, where the safe room was, the whole thing. But at any rate, who knows? We weren't there, but I just, I'm telling you, this is going to be one of the best stories in the history of society, and we don't know the whole story yet. That's just all there is to it. That's what's really cool. I mean, there's just, there's too many loose ends to this Benghazi story for it not to have some stuff that's been hidden. And still, don't forget the administration story that the attack in Benghazi was the result of an anti-Muslim film. The attack on Benghazi was because of a video? That in and of itself, I think, is, is spellbinding, if you know what I mean. Who came up with the video idea? That's the that'd be the question I would ask the president of the United States if I was in the press corps. But if you asked the president like if you asked the president a question like that, you would never ever be back into the press room in the White House again. You would be you you'd have your access cut off. But that's the question I'd ask the president. I'd say, who came up with the video excuse for Benghazi? That's that's definitely the story I would want to know. Oh, this is kind of interesting. You know, a lot of people out there think that Obama does a lot of things by executive fiat, and he does. And I'm pretty sure he's done it more than any other uh, president in the history of the United States. But the, the word always comes up that President Obama is acting like a tyrant. And someone put up the def definition of tyrant. I thought it was worthy of mentioning. It says, tyrant, a person exercising power or control in a cruel, unusual, or arbitrary way. And what I thought of is just the rollout of Obamacare and all the people that are losing their, their health care. I mean, that's, a, that's an example of, of cruel and unusual. I mean, right now, there's probably 15 million people that don't have health care because of Obamacare. Now that's kind of cruel and unreasonable. And maybe there is something to the idea that President Obama is a bit of a tyrant. You know, I just don't think it's just necessarily crazy speak, you know what I mean? Okay, let's move on here. Oh, this story is such a classic. You know, this and this story dem demonstrates more than just being a good story. It demonstrates the incompetence in the Obama White House. Or maybe they're just a little bit overworked and, and really don't have enough time to vet some of these events that they put on. But remember here recently, I'm trying to think which speech it was. Within the last three days, President Obama gave a, 
a major address and he he brought this lady out I can't remember which one it was but you know what I'm talking about in the last five days that you know was another one of these campaign style Barack Obama events and he was talking about how health care has got some troubles, but it's going to be worked out. Everyone just has to hang in there and be patient. Everything's going to everything's going to be just fine. And he trotted out this one woman, and I don't know her name, but we'll we'll hear about this woman's story in this video. And and this was a big deal to President Obama. And and uh, it turns out this woman was saying about how she uh she got on she got Obamacare or she got on the website and she jumped through all the hoops and she got a estimate and everything and it was a lot less than her current health care plan. And she's up on the stage with President Obama, at least I think she was on the stage with President Obama. But and President Obama's touting her as a, a success story of Obamacare and uh and then, see, then it turns out that this woman's story, or there was, a, there was a twist, there was a bureaucratic twist in this woman's case, and I think what it was, there was actually a mistake, and her, her new Obamacare premium was going to be three times higher. But this was, of course, after the hoopla where President Obama was taking a, a, a vow. But this is the kind of thing that that I think points to the incompetence of this administration. I mean, you would want to make sure that if you're going to use a woman in in this way or anyone in this way, you'd want to check their story out and make sure there isn't something screwed up with it. Because down the road, you could have this kind of thing happen where what the president said, again, isn't true, and it tears away at his credibility. And I think that this is uh, an example of President Obama's staff either being incompetent or they may be overworked. I mean, he, he's basically running a campaign and has been running a campaign for the last five years. And setting up all these events, it takes a lot of man hours. Trust me, advance work, setting up an event like this, takes a lot of man hours. So let's, let's give this a listen. All right, welcome to the Trailer Park Profit Show. Obamacare fiasco. First, newly released documents revealing a private consulting firm warned the administration that healthcare.gov, that the website could be a disaster in the making. Way back in the spring, they got these warnings. And the second problem, a CNN exclusive. A Washington state mom hailed as an Obamacare success story by the president in a speech just last month. Well, now she says she can't afford the insurance and blames the state healthcare exchanges. Let's bring in senior White House correspondent Jim Acosta, who has all of these late details this morning. Good morning, Jim. Good morning, Kate. That's right. Jessica Sanford was cited by the president as an Obamacare success story at a health care event he had here at the White House in the Rose Garden on October 21st. Uh, that, of course, being just last month, uh, the 48-year-old single mom from Washington State uh, purchased what she considered to be affordable health care, a life-changing event, she said, on the Washington State Health Exchange. Uh, and she decided she was so excited about this news, she wanted to write an email to the president to say that this had really changed her life and that she was thankful for the Affordable Care Act. Uh, the president included her email in his remarks uh, to uh, people on hand for the event. Here's a bit of what he had to say. I recently received a letter from a woman named Jessica Sam, uh, Jessica Sam in Washington State. Here's what she wrote. Uh, I am a single mom. No child support, self-employed, and I haven't had insurance for 50 years because it's too expensive. I was crying the other day when I signed up. So much stress living. Uh, but days, uh, just really three days after she was mentioned by the president, Jessica Sanford started having problems. She was receiving letters from the Washington State Health Exchange, the first letter telling her that tax credit was reduced, uh, therefore, uh, therefore increasing the cost of her health care plan. And then uh, take a look at this. Then she received a letter just last week telling her that her tax credit had been taken away altogether. Show you another document here showing what the tax credit worked out to be according to the Washington State Health Exchange. Zero dollars according to this document that was provided to us 
uh, by Jessica Sanford. Uh, she describes all of this as a roller coaster ride because now she says she can't afford insurance in Washington State because of these new developments. Here's what she told us in an exclusive TV interview. It was like riding a big roller coaster. You know, they have my credit card, they have the payment date, and and then, you know, once again, I'm knocked down, and this time it's to zero, and at my rate of pay with my family size, I just don't understand why I wouldn't get at least a little help with a tax credit. It was a huge disappointment, and especially since I had, you know, my story had been shared by the president, and I felt like, you know, uh, I just felt really embarrassed that, you know, he had quoted my story and then come to find that the Washington Health Plan Finder, the website here in our state, um, had grossly miscalculated or they're having a problem figuring their tax credits. Um, and so at least for right now, I don't, I'm not going to be getting insurance. Oh. Now, Jessica Stanford is not alone, according to this letter that she got from the Washington State Health Exchange, also known as Washington Health Plan Finder. Uh, we sa It says that other Washington State residents, applicants to the State Health Exchange, are also receiving these letters, informing them that their tax credits have been miscalculated. When we went back to the uh, Washington State Health Exchange officials for a comment, they said uh, that they were already looking into it and would get back to us. But, uh, guys, uh, Jessica Sanford tells us what is so frustrating about all this is that she's a President Obama supporter. She voted for the president. She supports the Affordable Care Act. But she says after being held up as an example of what was working right with the health care plan, according to the president, she now sort of feels like an example of what's not working, at least in her home state of Washington State. And the one other thing we should point out, you mentioned that uh, those documents that were released uh, by House Republican Committee uh, chairman uh, last night, uh, those documents indicate that uh, as of last March, Senior White House or senior administration officials, including Kathleen Sebelius, the Health and Human Services Secretary, was aware of some of the problems with the website earlier this year, back in March. Uh, those concerns, according to uh, Republican members of this one committee, uh, the Energy and Commerce Committee, uh, they feel like uh, they were not told the full story by Kathleen Sebelius based on those documents that were provided uh, by a consultant uh, firm that was uh, advising the administration on the health care plan. Guys, back to you. All right, Jim, appreciate the reporting. All right. Um, as you can see, it's a colossal screw-up, and President Obama has got a lot of explaining to do. But, the, you know, that this, this story was from CNN, and, you know, they're not exactly known as a conservative bastion. Hi, Eric. Whoa. Hey. It's Dan Gray. It's Dan Gray, yes, sir. Brother. Nice Good to, to see, see ya. you, man. Hey. You back around for a minute? Or? Yeah, I'm going to be here for a couple months. Sweet. Yeah. Look forward to yeah, nice to see ya. Yeah, you. You look great. Too, That's one of my friends from oh. way back when. Yeah. Eight years I like ago. The, uh, I like the Stegosaurus Ridge. Here. Yeah, hey, thank you. Yeah. Nice see, uh, she's my little girl. Yeah. Very nice. Cheers. Good to see you, man. Oh, thank you, Eric. Well, it's good to be back here in... Crestone, Colorado. But you know what I'm going. What what I'm thinking though with this story is it's it's emblematic of what's going on with with President Obama and his administration, and they keep making these kind of blunders. And I really I really think it's a, a factor of overworked staff that they don't have enough time to vet these these kind of people that are being used as props for President Obama's campaign style promote Obama swing for America which is what he's having to do basically President Obama is trying to sell his product of Obamacare I mean that that's what we got going on here we got a president of the United States that is a pitch man for a product that being Obamacare and here he is citing this woman's experience as a good experience of, of this big, wonderful, expensive product, the most expensive product in the history of mankind, and, and it's not working. I wonder if President Obama is embarrassed by stuff like this. You know, I like to say that progressives, they don't, they don't feel irony or hypocrisy, and if I was President Obama, I would be embarrassed. I don't know about you, 
But I would have never let this happen. I would have been on top of this. I would have had regular scheduled meetings with my chief of staff and, and head of health and human Ser services, Kathy Sebelius, and I would want regular updates because I wouldn't want to be a party to a screw-up. I've worked on campaigns. I've, I've run big landscape projects, and you got to stay on top of things. You can't just let your people run your job site or, or run your project be without your supervision because things will invariably get screwed up and end up costing you more money. So I guess that's just kind of a tribute to President Obama's experience of never running anything, you know, and if, if you if it's not your money, you don't have that, that sort of intrinsic motivation to make things don't get screwed up. I mean, with the experience I have, I know that uh, if I'm in charge of something or an aspect of something, I know i got to stay on top of it because I personally don't want to be a party to a screw-up because that's my, my life. I mean, my reputation, you know, my, my you're only as good as your last job in the private sector. And, and everyone's making the comparison that, that President Obama has... He's just done a terrible job. I mean, it's a it's a screw up. All right, let's see. Move on. I was actually thinking of a guy, Jim, I was talking to down at Shimbala here in Crestone, Colorado, and he was a, a hardcore liberal. And um, I talked to him for the first time in eight years, but he, he's a good example of, of how the population act, actually views Obamacare. I think. And he thinks it's a total debacle, which really surprises me, particularly here in, in Crestone, Colorado. I mean, we're in the lap of, of spiritual progressive socialism, you know what I mean? I mean, it doesn't get any more lefty than Crestone, Colorado. Uh, let's see here. Um, and then more and more stories are coming out about how uh, the, the Obama administration knew that Obamacare would force people to lose their uh, employer insurance companies. See, I told you, I warned you about this all along. I mean, not that I have any great insight, but see, if you think things are bad now, with just the, the people that had the individual insurance policies, I'm telling you, I know I've told you guys this over and over and over again, but once the employer mandate kicks in, it's going to be a disaster. It's going to be, I mean, people are going to be losing their insurance and all over the United States like they are already are, but the numbers are going to be three times, four times what we've seen now, and we've had, what, three, four billion policies canceled? Wait till the independent, or the employer mandate kicks in. It, it's going to be mayhem. It's hard, really, to get your mind around it. I, I, you know, I see a huge march on Washington DC and and I know this sounds kinda far-fetched but in the future I can see this happening I, you know the Tea Party whether you like them or not it was an organic organization that developed out of the United States all over the United States independent of each other against Obamacare that's what started the Tea Party and I have a feeling if if things continue like they are with President Obama and the employer mandate kicks in, I think you're going to see a new organization. It's going to maybe be under the Tea Party, maybe under another name, uh, but it, it's going gonna, it's gonna to be huge. I see a march on the White House or, or the Capitol. I really do. And I'm trying to think what other kind of harbingers are out there that, you know, we could kind of get a feel for... Uh, how Obamacare rollout's going to be. I guess you just, um, well, we'll see. The last election we had, what, three weeks ago, that did kind of give us a harbinger in, in that governor's race, race in, in, what was that, not Long Island, but at any rate, the Democrat, he was an odds-on favorite like four months ago. He had a three-to-one margin, and then after uh, the Obamacare story started to hit in the 1st of October, his numbers shrank, and he ended up only winning like 2% of the vote, and everyone is, is pointing to that 
as a harbinger of things to come in, in elections and stuff. So everyone out there in the political world has been saying that 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 uh, the insiders, you know, all the the political democratic wonky types are all worried about the atmosphere out there and how the people are reacting to Obamacare. So this is going to be a really interesting time in history. I mean, this is going to be more fun than than you could ever imagine. And I think it's a, a good opportunity for people to actually see the, the collapse of big government. I mean, some people are even couching it in that light, like like Charles Krauthammer, he thinks that the fall of Obamacare could be the fall of socialism in the United States. That's how gargantuan he thinks this whole Obamacare thing is to the history of society, that it could, it could in and of itself change the course of history. And I, I have to kind of pat myself on the back because after President Obama got elected, I did say that President Obama was is going to be the best thing to ever happen to the Republican Party, and we'll we'll be able to see this bore out, borne out in the upcoming election in 2014. That's going to tell us a lot. I mean, the the, the country is going to head in the direction it's going to head after the 2014 election. Okay, let's see here. Oh, I, you know, I haven't talked a lot about this. Uh, and um, because there hasn't been that many leaks out there about the inner workings of the Obama administration. Back in the day, like in, in like 2011, you could find all kinds of, of leaked insider stuff that was coming out of the White House. And then somehow all that stuff got shut down or... You know, for all I know, people could have been just using fiction and creating that stuff on their own. I mean, I don't really know, but it, I mean, they seem like they sure seem like real stories at the time. But it, it's it, they're interesting, you know, because it's kind of like palace intrigue. You know, if you think you're on the inside of the Obama administration, it, it gives you a, a, a real special feeling. You know, you kind of feel like, wow, you know, this is this is how it really happens. And so uh, this story comes from the conservative infidel dot com. And I really love the name. And I think their stories seem pretty good. But the story is written by Benjamin Franklin. Did we do a story about him? I think we already. Yeah, I think we did a story about him on Monday. And um before I before I go into the story, I should probably interrupt my soliloquy here. This is Daniel Gray. I am the Trailer Park Prophet, and we're broadcasting live from Crestone, Colorado, on the porch of the Blitz. Very nice restaurant. I just had a burger and fries. I showed you the meal. God, it was a wonderful burger, and the fries are just gorgeous. Nice presentation. Uh, my dog is seems happy, and... Um, I'm happy. So, anyways, on with this story from Benjamin Franklin. Can you imagine having a name like Benjamin Franklin? It goes on to say here, as the story of Obamacare website fiasco unfolds, senior aides tell me that the president is mad, frustrated, and angry. Mad that, that the signature legislative achievement is stuck at the gate frustrated that he's running out of time to fix it and angry that he's got a second term agenda now going nowhere he is furious in fact that he stepped out of character to vent to a assembled group of top aides quote if i had known about the website problems the stimming president the steaming president reportedly said according to the new york times we could have delayed the website. All of which begs the real question, how could he not have known? I mean, that's, that's the big question everybody's asking themselves. How could the president not know that the website was jacked up? And it goes on to say, it says, all of which begs the question, okay, uh, excuse me, it's a, it's a real head scratcher. <laughs> the most powerful man in the free world most important issue 
most politically explosive, particularly coming on the heels of the government shutdown. Consider the content Republicans had just tried to defund Obamacare, and they lost in a heap of public humiliation. So the rollout of Obamacare had to be really impressive because the Republicans had to be proven wrong. And yet, as the dry runs continued to produce red flags over and over again, the president remained in his steely cocoon. If this were the pres presidency of George W. Bush or Ronald Reagan, the obvious theories would abound. The chief executive is disengaged or incurious or worse. But since Obama is none of the above, what gives? This much is clear after speaking with uh, both past and present senior administration officials. No one was really in charge, so no one knew for sure how bad the overall picture was. What's more, and perhaps most telling, no one wanted to even hint to the president that his techo-savvy administration possibly had a website stuck in, say, 1995. People don't like to tell him bad news, says a ex-White House staffer. Part, part of it is the no-drama culture. And so the people are scared to death to bring bad news to this president, particularly on something that the president's uh, chief legislation is chief creation. People are scared to death. And I, 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 can, I can just see this being... Uh, President Obama's demeanor behind the scenes that he he's very mean he'll get pissed off he'd point his finger he'd, he'd embarrass you in a group of people we had another story on Monday that was was kind of the same thing remember we were talking about that President Obama came into this meeting of staff members and dressed a few people down in front of the group so this guy Obama he's livid and he thinks these people have somehow embarrassed him that's how I think the, the psychology actually presents itself here. You know, the president feels embarrassed and he's hamstrung by the office that he can't go out there and say, hey, I got a bunch of losers on my staff and they're not even capable of putting together a basic website because he understands that that relates to his ability to hire competent people. It all reflects on the president. So it compounds the problem the president has and, and why he, he's so angry and furious behind the scenes because it's, his, it's, it's really only real avenue that he has available to him to vent. But it just, it, it, it's, it's an interesting study. I mean, it's an interesting psychological study and, and I just think it's more interesting than a lot of other stuff you could be spending your time on. I mean, it's just that, again, politics is so much better than reality television. Okay, hey, listen, why don't you guys, someone give me a call. If you'd like to be on the Trailer Park Profit Show, you can do that by giving me a call at 646-716-8506. Again, if you'd like to talk to the Prophet, you can dial 646-716-8506. I would love to hear from you. And again, I'm happy to be here. We're, we're live on the porch of the Bliss in Crestone, Colorado. I drove my 1985 F-250, pulling my fifth wheel over three mountain passes to get here. I lived here back in the late 90s and I left here in 2005. I lived here in Crestone eight years. I had a lot of fun. It's a really beautiful place and it's just kind of nice to be back. So I'll give you some updates as we move along if I decide to do that. I don't know. Okay, here we go. Do, 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 do. Um, no, we're not going to do that story. You know, here's... Every day, every day on my Facebook page, almost every day, there's another disgusting picture of just sheer, sheer savage behavior in Muslim society. And here's a picture here on my Facebook page. And you can go to my Facebook page, Daniel Gray, and you can see 
what I think is interesting, and you can read some of the things I've written about. But it, because of Sharia law, this homeless kid in Iran stole a loaf of bread because he was starving. So to show how peaceful and compassionate Islam is, they ran over the arm of this little boy with a truck. And it says, note the fingers of an adult holding this little boy's arm in place so that this truck could run over this kid's arm. And granted, this kid's arm looks like it's wrapped up in a towel, but this picture definitely looks real to me. I mean, part of this little kid's arm is underneath this tire. And granted, there might be more to the story, but I don't think any reasonable person thinks that running over a kid's arm is the way to handle theft. At least I don't. It, it, you know, and I don't want to go into a big philosophical discussion here, but I just, I just think that's cruel and unusual. And I think stoning a woman to death because she committed adultery is beyond the pale too and, and somewhat savage but if you if you look into Sharia law as I've asked all of you to do um, I think you agree with me that Sharia law is nothing more than barbarism okay let's see uh, ta -da, ta -da. oh this is kind of funny I, I mean this is kind of maybe going into the weeds too much about Obamacare except if you're following this stuff at all, you should be up to speed with these uh, revelations. But remember, in Obamacare, as it passed, before anyone in the free world had an opportunity to read it, there was a grandfather clause in Obamacare that allowed Obama to be able to say that if you like your insurance plan, you can keep it. If you like your doctor, you can keep it. That was known as the grandfathering bothering provision and this is this is an example of how it's written in the Obamacare law and it says even under the grandfathering provision it is projected that a majority of group health plans will have lost their grandfather status by the end of 2013 which which means that it could be even worse than what I was talking about earlier. And this comes from Priest for Life versus HHS. Oh, and this was, this is an interesting sort of entry level or entry uh, access point for another explanation of, of that the administration knew that all of these health insurance plans were not going to be grandfathered in and were going to be lost because of Obamacare because the, the they were involved with this um, legal case. Health and Human Services was involved with this legal case, Priests for Life, and they had to disclose to the court during, um, what do you call it, when you, when the uh, you can uh, during discovery to find out how Obamacare was working and they had to admit that even under the grandfathering provision it is projected that the majority of group health plans will have lost their grandfather status so they found out through discovery in this court case priests for life versus HHS that everyone in the administration should have known could have known just from the outcome of this one court case. So it kind of gives you another example besides all the memos we're finding out there that everyone across the whole spectrum in the Obama administration knew that it was going to it was going to collapse the whole private insurance market basically. And it seems like that that it was designed to do that or it it's the most colossal screw up in the history of mankind. I mean it's kind of a either or thing, I guess. Okay, uh, let's see here. Where am I? Moving on. I'm out here on the porch of the bliss. I'm a little cold. Uh, no, I don't want to do that story. Ugh. Oh, let's do this story. This is kind of fun. I got this serious story I want to do. Former official bash bashes Fred Policy. 
Fred policy, Fed policy. I got to start saying Federal Reserve instead of the Fed, because then I won't make that mistake of saying Fred again. It's kind of embarrassing. Okay, this story comes by way of the Digital Journal. And here, let me come on. It says, um, hang on here. I'm going to have to do my zippity doodah song here to cover up. No dead time here at the Trailer Park Profit Show. Okay. All right. This is this this story's from uh, Switzerland. It's written by John Thomas Digmus, D I D Y M U S. Says the local chapter of the Left Tea Party, a socialist and feminist political party in Sorland County Council, Sweden is pushing to make standing while peeing illegal for men using the county council's public restrooms. No kidding. Public officials are pushing to make public restrooms in the, the county council sitting only. According to the local supporters of the proposal, say sitting while urinating is more hygienic and promotes sanitary restroom habit for male users. It will help to eliminate the problem of puddles on the floor and spray stains on the toilet seats. <laughs> That's what it says, man. You can't make this stuff up. All right, got a little dog fight going here. Come here, little girl. Come here. All right, hang on. Uh, they also argue that urinating while sitting will help to promote male health because it allows men to empty their bladder more effectively. Sitting while urinating, according to advocates, will produce less prostate problems among men. So, you know, there's actually a, a medical reason. The local reports that has a compromise, the party has proposed that some toilets could in the interim be designed exclusively for men who must remain standing while peeing. <laughs> the left's party, Virgo Hansen, who made the proposal, said that ultimately he wants office toilets in the council to be genderless and would thus like to see only sit-down toilets in the county council offices. He said that the move should not be seen as meddling in the bathroom habits of people. He told the Servinji's television, SVT, quote, that's not what we're doing. We want to give men the option of going into a, a clean toilet. The proposals across, oh, whoops, the the, let's see here. Uh, but proposals across Europe to enforce sitting only reg regulation in public toilets have been criticized. Dr. John Gamble of Louisville University, writing in The Naked Scientist, <laughs> noted that the push to enact legislation banning men from standing while peeing in restrooms is spreading in Europe with feminists pushing similar legislation in Germany, France, and Holland. <laughs> and, and so, I mean, what is this? Is this part of the wussification of men? Is this a, a, an attempt to make men into metrosexual skippies? I mean, is this part of the demasculation of men in society? And it, it goes on here, it says, according to Gamel, the liberated women of France and Germany and Holland have vowed to put their men down on the toilet. They carry placards showing a huge red X scrawled across a man standing to urinate. They spout, <laughs> lazy and tuber, vorte, pralenten, et yasvet, ovis, meaning drop your trousers and sit. <laughs> and it says, Behefte denate por profen, fool of it, which means keep your drips to yourself. <laughs> and, and, and they have other placards that read, Not another filthy puddle on my bathroom floor. 
Gamel argues that the legislation cannot force men to adopt more supposedly sanitary habits while peeing. He told the Huffington Post that the spray and splatter during shake-off will, will not be prevented because, quote, no man will want to shake off while sitting on the toilet to avoid sticking the hand inside the toilet. I mean, this is just, this is just so amazing. And here we got a little more from the naked scientist. <laughs> I love that, the naked scientist. Uh, Gamel writes in The Naked Scientist, Most of the spray sprinkles that so enrage European women occur not during the act of urination itself, but immediately afterward, during the ritual men l learn as part of their potty training the various maneuvers required to discharge the urine remaining on the ure urethia. <laughs> a man who tucks away his penis without performing these maneuvers will dribble half of an ounce of urine into his underwear. That's true, causing an embarrassing stain in the crotch of his trousers. So, <laughs> an even more embarrassing streak down his trouser leg to avoid the debacle every singent male after every urination carefully squeezes or milks his member to assure that no spray drops remain within the urethra. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, it's. <laughs> Unfortunately, some men pursue this goal with excessive vigor, indulging in what can be only described as shaking off the last drop. It is precisely these moments and not the free-falling stream itself that deposit most of the unwanted urine on lavatory floors throughout the world. So, <laughs> this is the direction we're headed in progressive socialist America now. <laughs> this, is what, this is what passes for <laughs> political debate. Oh man, making men sit down when they pee. Oh man, uh, and getting into the the whole physics of shaking off your wiener. And they must have done some extensive studies to come to this conclusion to figure out, okay, where's <laughs> where does the most splatter actually occur? <laughs> Oh, you got to love this world, you know? It, may you live in interesting times and may you may you be able to laugh every day. You know, if you can have those things happen, you know, you're you're ahead of the game by a large margin. margin. All right. Um Uh this is Daniel Gray. I am the Trailer Park Prophet. Broadcasting live on the porch of the Bliss Restaurant and Bar. Really nice, really nice place. I'm in the shade, so I'm getting colder all the time. And uh, I want to thank everybody for being here. This is Hump Day with the Prophet, and I'm I'm really glad to be here. I, I got this show put together by the skin of my teeth. I, I wasn't able to get my fifth wheel hooked up. I've been dicking around with these power cords and some other things. I, I was trying to back up my fifth wheel, and it became abundantly clear that I don't have the backup gene. I, I, I was just beside myself. I, I couldn't get my mind around that I had to reverse everything. If I wanted to go right, I had to think left or whatever is involved and backing up. I, I don't have that skill. I think I may have eventually got it, but I, I got so frustrated that my friend came to my aid and backed up my fifth wheel and ended my, my mental torment. But at any rate, for whatever reason, I didn't get the backup gene. But, you know, what are you going to do? Have you seen these new... I guess it's a trend... You know, along the line of uh, tattoos and and piercings and you know stuff like that, actually altering your your physical being in the name of art. 
I have right in front of me on the screen here on my Facebook page. It shows a, an example of what these kids are doing. They they actually, I don't know really what they're doing here, but they stretch out their lip and they have a actual window into their mouth. You, it's it's below their their mouth, and you can look through this clear piece of glass, which is implanted in in their their chin and you can see their teeth and it's weird but evidently it's the latest trend in Portland and it's just weird it's a piece of glass in in your lip below your mouth and you can look in in through this piece of glass and actually see this kid's lower teeth and it's it's just freaky it really is and one of my friends wrote that she or Doug thought that it was moronic self mutilators with extremely low self esteem and I gotta admit I, I had have to kinda of agree with that and you know these people are really desperate to be different desperate to just desperate I just see this as an act of desperation myself uh, Jason Fortuna writes, and these idiots wonder why they don't have a decent job. I hope every person that they drool on whips their ass. But it, it, it's designed so you don't drool, it looks like. I th it, Maybe it isn't a piece of glass. Maybe it's just like a, a ring that separates your lower part of your mouth so you can look into your, your lower teeth. But I... Maybe, I, I don't know, you have to see it. it it's really weird. Uh, the Bruce Cohen, my friend in Costa Rica, wrote, uh, he said, S-H-I-T, that scares me, and basically called them idiots. But I, I, what I wrote on on this blog, which I thought was kind of interesting, I, I, I and this is something that I, I worry about, in in some people's psychic that they do these extreme things that really are kind of mutilating their bodies it it's kind of weird you know it's it's just it, it just ain't normal buffy but i said that there's a tipping point at which time or sometime or uh, any someone or anyone that is trying so hard to be different becomes what they feared the most in becoming the new normal, the flavor of the day, another pedestrian offering. And what I meant by that is, I saw this in the punk movement. People were going out of their way to be different, and they basically were the same, because they were immolating something that didn't exist. But they thought, oh, I'm being so provocative, I'm being so avant-garde, I'm being so different, I'm cutting edge, I'm making a statement. But when you but when you're in a a number of hundreds and thousands and tens of thousands that are doing the same thing, well you've you've totally defeated your purpose. You've just become part of a crowd. And it, it I just I, I just think it's profoundly interesting how desperate people are to be different. It means a lot to a lot of people that there's something other than the ordinary. And it's obvious that they'll go to great lengths to uh, accomplish that feat. And I think it, it's just indicative of the human experience and it, it's always going to be there. And there's probably not much that you can do about it. You know, that's just kind of the way it is. Oh, um, I told you on Friday or Monday, I can't remember, I did that story about Martin Bashir, the, the CNN commentator who suggested that someone ought to shit down Sarah Palin's throat and piss in her eyeballs. Well, he came out and gave what I would consider a very tepid apology on uh, CNN or MSNBC the other night and it was really kind of less than really impressive but uh, he did come out gave a half-hearted apology and uh, but he didn't he you know 
I mean, we can read it here. But, you know, let's just move on. I, I don't even want to talk about this animal. But this guy, Martin Bashir, for saying that about seven, Sarah Palin ought to be fired. And you know damn good and well that if anyone from the conservative media had said anything against a Democratic woman and used this kind of uh, verbal attack and imagery, that that individual would have lost his job at Fox or wherever. And this guy, Martin Bashir, is, is outside the, the bounds of decent behavior. And as such, I, I think uh, it's, it's obvious to see that he, he needs to be fired. You can't say these kinds of things and get fired. Unless CNN condones this type of, of dialogue. But this is so severe that I think CNN ha has to take some sort of action. He has to be disciplined, if not fired. I mean, first, this guy ought to be fired. He shouldn't be working in the media. I mean, if this is his his demeanor, then it, it's not suitable for, for decent company. And he ought to be fired. And I even wrote here, I thought, I said, Dear Martin Bashir, if you are ever in Colorado, I would like to defend Sarah P Palin's honor and meet you anytime, anywhere, when you visit Colorado to kick your ass. <laughs> we are about the same age and I can guarantee you your ego is writing checks your body cannot cash. At least not in my presence. Mano y mano. You and me, Skippy, call me. And I even put in my my telephone number. But I I did this a few nights ago, and, and I thought I was going to be kind of embarrassed telling you that. But you know what? I don't, there's a time at which people's behavior is out, outside the confines of civilized behavior. And by acting in this manner that Martin Bashir has acted, he's beyond being diplomatic. In, in, in some respect I think he needs to get his ass kicked I really do and I think if this guy did come to Crestone or wherever I'm at I think I would I, I would have to say something to him I'd want to at least I'd want to look him in the eye and say you sir are way out of la line you're not a gentleman you're acting like a a punk and I think I you know I'd want to get in his face a little bit and just, just kind of tell him that I think he's a, a really ugly human being and that he ought to be ashamed of himself and perhaps maybe he should never reproduce. As they say, it's beyond the pale. And would I actually meet with Martin Bashar? I actually would. I think I would. Okay, let's see. Here's a story about Michelle Obama. Uh, let's see. Oh, did you hear this? This was kind of interesting. I think it was yesterday or was it today? Is the 150th anniversary of President Lincoln's Gettysburg Address. Thought by many one of the best top five speeches in the history of mankind. And President Obama chose not to be there on the 150th anniversary, which is a big deal. And a lot of people are scratching their heads and saying, what's up, Mr. President? Because President Obama is always invoking the name of President Lincoln and cites him as, as one of his guideposts to follow while administering in his uh, time in the White House. So the president has really gone out of his way to try to somehow um, connect himself to President Lincoln. So a lot of people are scratching their heads. Why isn't President Obama going to be to this dedication, particularly because uh, he doesn't have anything on his schedule? He could have very easily decided to, to go to this uh, Gettysburg 150 anniversary and chose not to. And a lot of people are just kind of looking into this or looking at that and saying, you know, what's up? Why did this happen? Huh. 
Okay, let's see. Uh, Mary Lincoln. Oh, this is kind of, uh, this is interesting. This is talking about the history of the First Lady's White House staff. And uh, Mary Lincoln was taken to task for purchasing China for the White House during the Civil War. Mammy Eisenhower had to shell out the salary of her personal secretary from her husband's salary. Total personal staff members for other first ladies paid by taxpayers. Uh, Mamie Eisenhower, one paid for uh, personally out of the president's salary. Jackie Kennedy, one. Rosalind Carter, one. Barbara Bush, one. Hillary Clinton, three. Laura Bush, one. Michelle Obama, 22. 22 White House staff members that are dedicated to Michelle Obama. 22. How many things have changed? If you're one of the tens of millions of Americans facing certain uh, destitution, earning less than substantive wages, stocking the shelves of Walmart, or serving up McDonald's cheeseburgers, prepare to scream and then come to realize that the benefit package of these servants for Michelle Obama are the same as members of the National Security and Defense Departments. And the bill for these assorted lackeys is paid by you, John Q. Public. Michelle's personal staff. Oh my God, look at this. <coughs> Number one. <coughs> Her name is Cher, or Susan Cher. She's the chief of staff. She gets $172,000 a year. $140,000 a year goes to Jocelyn Fry, deputy assistant to the president and director of policy and projects for the first lady. Number three, 113000 goes to Desiree Rogers, special assistant to the president of the White House, social secretary for Mrs. Obama. Number four gets $102,000. Her name is Camille Y. Johnson, Special Assistant to the President and Director of Communications for the First Lady. Number five gets $100,000. Melissa Winter, she's the Special Assistant to the President and Deputy Chief of Staff to the First Lady. Number six gets not, but it just goes on and on and on and on and on. What's to see? What's number 21? Oh, number 21 gets $35,000, and her name is, is Natalie Bookie, and she's a, a staff assistant. But the lowest paid person on, on President Obama's wife's staff is $35,000. Uh, it says here, the first 1591000 in annual salaries, all for someone we did not vote for and apparently have no control over. <laughs> That's her annual salaries for her 21 employees, a million and a half dollars. And that doesn't include their medical benefits, and, and they get to pay into the federal retirement plan. I mean, I'm sure that gets vested. So this is only the beginning of the cost. Unbelievable. There, was ne there has never been anyone in the White House at any time who has created such an army of staffers whose sole duties are the facilitation of the First Lady's social life. One wonders why she needs so much help at taxpayers' expense. Note, uh, this does not include makeup artists. That's right, she has a makeup artist. Ingrid Grimes Miles, 49, and first hairstylist Johnny Wright, 31, both of whom travel aboard Air Force One to Europe. <laughs> oh man, I mean, it's they're they're acting like royalty, and it says this does not include. Okay, I already read that. Makes you want to cry or puke. All right, uh, let's see here. You're listening to Daniel Gray. I am the Trailer Park Prophet. And we're broadcasting live on the porch of the bliss here in Crestone, Colorado, where it is increasingly getting colder out here. <laughs> um, oh, here's an interesting story. This was on the, the Sunday talk programs, too. A lot of people have been talking about 
whether or not the Obama administration cooked the unemployment numbers before the election in November 20, 2012, and there was a big uh, hubu, hubbub over whether or not they were actually cooking the unemployment numbers or not. Um, I'm not sure really what's going on there, but a lot of people who follow these kinds of things are really questioning those numbers. Uh, let's see, uh, Trouble in Paradise. This story comes by way of the blaze. The number of long-term unemployment unemployed Americans has shot up by a staggering percentage since 2007. You know, there's now, I mean, it was announced last month that 95 million Americans are out of work. And the majority of those aren't even looking. Oh, okay, I did that story last week. All right, let's see here. Um, uh oh, something's going wrong at the studio. All right, hey, you know what? I'm gonna, I'm having some troubles at the studio, and I think I lost my connection. Hang on here. All right, it looks like I got it. Oh, well, maybe not. All right, everybody, look. Um, I'm going to take this as an opportunity to bug off. I actually did one hour and 20 minutes. And we're going to call it a show for, day, for today, and we'll see you on Friday. Oh, wait, no, I can't do that. All right, everybody, I'm back. We got disconnected. I'm not sure if we're on or not. Yeah, we're on. Welcome back. This is Daniel Gray. I am the Trailer Park Prophet, broadcasting live from Crestone, Colorado. This is Hump Day with the Prophet. I'm sorry we just had some technical difficulties. That's going to happen once in a while. All right, uh, let's see here. I, I'm kind of operating by the seat of my pants right now. And you know what? Oh, here, here's something interesting. It says here, poll, Obama hits record disapproval rating. Obamacare support tanks. My friend Kevin McGarry writes, no, no more swag. Now just sag. Mr. Prez, it's now finally sagging. Are people waking up enough to thoroughly reject his diabolical, sinister policies and actions? Time will tell. As we go to the polls next year, we must replace all those who have voted for Obamacare. And we'll definitely confirm our resolve and send a poignant message. That's from my, Kev my friend Kevin McGarry. And he's a black conservative. He's a black conservative. I mean, he, he's one of the people that you wouldn't think exist in, in our society. But he does. He's out there. And here's a story. This is from Breitbart. And it says, A new poll released by the Washington Post, ABC News, reports bad news for Obama. The president has hit a record disapproval rating of 56 
among RVs, 55% among adults, and his Affordable Care Act is tanking in public opinion. Not only does the public disapprove of Obama's performance, more than half do not like him. 52% say they have unfavorable image of the president to drive that home. The three metrics used to measure Obama's leadership and empathy are all in the red. Half of more now say he is not a strong leader, does not understand the problems of people like you, and is not honest and trustworthy. Perceptions of the president as a strong leader have dropped 15 points since January, and over the past year the percentage has registered voters who say he is not honest and trustworthy has increased 12 points. So these are devastating numbers. These ratings carry over to opinions on Obamacare. 56% say Obama is not a good manager and is evident when looking at opinions about his health care program specifically. Almost two-thirds, 63% disapprove of the program's rollout and 57 straight up oppose the Affordable Care Act, a 10% jump from last month. The linchpin of Obama's program, the mandate to purchase insurance, also performs quite poorly with two-thirds, 65% opposing it. Polls are considered to be a snapshot in time, right? So there's no telling if the American sour outlook on Obama and Obamacare will stick. That's a good point. Obama has promised to rebrand, oh, I didn't even hear this. Obama promised to rebrand his health care program and it remains to be seen if the country will give him a second chance. Certainly the unintended consequences or rather the particulars of the law which were concealed from public are not popular and indicate that if the public had read the law before they passed it, it might not have ever been approved. And that of course is the key point. If people would have known the truth of Obamacare, they would have been against it in droves. And I, I, I don't think, I don't think a person's being un, unreasonable or mean-spirited to suggest that the American people were not to, told the truth about Obamacare. And we'll just have to see if this is going to be the continual slide. I mean, we've been reporting now that Obama's core approval rating has been dropping for the last month and a half, and and in particular in the last month, his numbers have been dropping like a rock all right let's see uh, um let's see um we can't do that all right you know what mm, oh here remember we were talking about on on monday this new game that black teens are doing knockout what happens is these black kids will go out to play knockout and they'll come up behind generally a stranger that that's walking down the sidewalk and they come up behind one of the guys comes up behind and cold cocks the person and it, it knocks them out cold they don't even know they've been hit that's how brutal this is hitting these people as hard as you can from behind it's horrible and it says here this story that is brought to Facebook by Angela Bronson. It says that a teen playing knockout game gets shot twice by unintended victim, then jailed. Now the end. Hmm. I wonder what that's about. Knockout. No kidding. That's what these black kids are doing. And, there, and there's gangs of them. And it's not just New York. It is New York, but it, it's Philadelphia, Chicago. I think it, there, there's kids doing knockout in in L.A. So it, it's out there. You imagine that uh, these kids, you know, they're on the same Internet stations and they kind of know, you know, what's going on. All right. That's not going to post. You know what, you guys? <clears throat> I am going to end the show and get out of here. Uh, I think I did a good job. I did an hour and a half. I don't have any other material. I didn't have any mo notes. I've been on the road for the last day and a half. So you know what I'm going to do? I'm going to go ahead and check out of here. And we'll see you on Friday for Local Friday. Again, thanks a lot for being here and have any kind of day you want.
Blog Talk Radio. Goodbye.